Watch this. Petty politics, a political stunt, misuse of power. Seven little words with big implications from Governor Brad Little, who's calling out Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan's out of the blue executive order on mask mandates. An executive order that was more than likely unconstitutional to begin with. The Idaho Attorney General's office has their take on the authority taken by the acting governor. Memorial Day remembrances are always monumental at the Idaho Veterans Cemetery. This year, they will be even more so, thanks to the creation of a local sculptor. In the span of 24 hours, or about the same time of that L Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan was acting governor, the state of Idaho was thrown into a state of political and pandemic confusion. A situation never before seen in the Gem State unfolded yesterday. Sitting in for the out-of-state Governor Little, Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan issued executive order banning mask mandates at state entities in Idaho. And that includes places like public schools. McGeehan was acting governor at this time, and Governor Little was out of the state attending a Republican governor's conference in Nashville. As the statute goes, according to the Constitution, if the governor is out of the state, well, then the lieutenant governor steps in. And 24 hours later, well, Little has undone that order. All of this is the backdrop for the race for Idaho governor. Last week, McGeehan announcing her candidacy for the 2022 race. Little is expected to do the same before next year's deadline. Joe Paris has details on those developments that we saw today from both Little and McGeehan. Idaho Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan started a 24-hour domino effect of unique political circumstances for the state of Idaho. While Governor Brad Little was away on business, Lieutenant Governor McGeehan stepped in to serve as governor, which is typical legal procedure. But unlike the last several times she filled in, this time McGeehan quickly took advantage of the circumstance to issue this executive order, prohibiting the state and its political subdivisions, including public schools, from imposing mask mandates in Idaho. Critics of the executive order, including Governor Little's office, say it was clearly a political play in her pursuit to be Idaho's next governor. The executive order itself also caused confusion for several entities across Idaho on how exactly it affected mask policies and guidance in places like public schools. Concerns with Lieutenant Governor McGeehan's order essentially became moot early Friday when Governor Brad Little, who returned to Idaho late Thursday, issued his own executive order undoing McGeehan's action. An extended statement, Little said, The executive order unilaterally and unlawfully takes away authorities given to the state's mayors, local school board trustees, and others. The governor's goal was to return power to the local control. Now, Governor Little added, The action that took place while I was gone this week is not gubernatorial. The action that took place was an irresponsible, self-serving political stunt. The governor went on to say, the executive order presents some pretty alarming unintended consequences, and he finishes saying the executive order also appears to conflict with other laws on the books. Now, Little also appeared to give advice to McGeehan, saying, quote, this is why you do your homework, Lieutenant Governor. The governor's office tells me they gave the Lieutenant Governor a heads up about their action shortly before it was announced Friday. We reached out to McGeehan for comments on the situation. She did not directly respond to our questions. She did, however, take to social media with her thoughts. She wrote, quote, Today, Governor Little chose to revoke your personal freedom by rescinding my order and imposing mask mandates on thousands of Idaho children. She continued to say, quote, I understand that protecting individual liberty means fighting against tyranny at all levels of government, federal, state, and local. It is your God-given right to make your own health decisions, and no state, city, or school district ever has the authority to violate your unalienable rights. Governor Little points out in his statement, though, that Idaho has never had a mask mandate and that he's actually opposed to mask mandates as a whole. Little explains, though, that through his actions during the pandemic, he, quote, didn't undermine separately elected officials who, under Idaho law, are given authorities to take measures that they believe will protect the health and safety of the people they serve. McGeehan wasted no time capitalizing on her executive order. On Thursday, she sent out a campaign email promoting her run for governor, saying, quote, I firmly believe that you have the right to make your own decisions about masks, vaccines, and how to raise your children. You don't need the government to tell you what to do, she wrote, before asking for campaign donations. The email appears to confirm speculation that the McGeehan executive order is a campaign ploy. Governor Little responded to that theory, saying, quote, I do not like petty politics. I do not like political stunts over the rule of law. 
However, the consequences of the lieutenant governor's flimsy executive order require me to clean up a mess with my own executive order today. Okay, Joe, I know that we've, all of us in the newsroom have reached out to Lieutenant Governor McGeehan today and got no response, but yet that hasn't stopped her from being very vocal on social media today. However, it appears she wasn't so, I guess, forthcoming with the governor when this executive order was issued yesterday. Is that correct? Yeah, the governor's office tells us that they found out about the executive order like many of us did through separate channels. Lieutenant governor's office did not reach out to Governor Little's office uh, before putting out the executive order as he was on the East Coast for the Republican Governor's Conference. Um, as you heard in the story, though, Brian, Governor Little did reach out to the lieutenant governor's office a short time before he put out his executive order this morning as a common courtesy. This has to add some a whole other level of animosity between these two offices. They have to work together for at least another year or so, being the number one and number two in the state. They're campaigning against each other. Now one of them is kind of, well, for lack of a better term, using the words they use, undermining the other. This can't be a good, healthy relationship. Yeah, and talking to my sources in the state house and in the Idaho politics world, Brian, there is significant concern from some about how the situation will play out. Um, on a call earlier today, the governor's office essentially telling members of the media that they are going to continue to try and work with the lieutenant governor's office and keep lines of communication open. But Brian, as you alluded to, we still have essentially a year until the Republican primary in May of 2022, and a lot could happen between now and then. There's a question asked of the governor's staff earlier today about about if this type of action from the lieutenant governor may lead to them maybe not traveling out of state for the next year. Now we didn't get a clear uh, answer to that. And of course, you know, the governor has lots of things to do here in Idaho and that sometimes involves leaving the state. So in terms of this happening again, Brian, and I know there's been questions about that. It is wait and see the lieutenant governor at the end of the day does assume the role of governor if he does leave the state. And maybe it's worth revisiting that statute on the books. Like, why is it even possible that the lieutenant governor can assume the duties of the governor just because he leaves the state? Doesn't happen when the president leaves the country, right? We'll see what happens, though. Again, that's a legislative issue. Yeah, that's correct. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say you're correct, Brian, in saying that, and I know that there's already been conversations at the state house um, among some lawmakers possibly looking at a constitutional amendment to maybe not necessarily rewrite the entire Constitution, but take a look at sections like that that could tailor things into the modern age. Brian, as we know, we all have uh, smartphones and social media to communicate now, and when the Constitution was written, the communication styles were a little bit different. And changing the Constitution, something they've already considered, as we saw with this last legislative session and several of them as well. But thank you very much, Joe. All right. Well, 24 hours ago, we're all wondering the same thing, and we kind of alluded to it, or at least Joe did with his story there. Was this executive order even legal? Well, it takes an official request from a sitting member of the Idaho legislature to find out from the state's attorney general, which is exactly what Senator Melissa Wintrow did after seeing that executive order issued yesterday. And Deputy Attorney General Brian Kane responded today. Senator Wintrow sent him a three question inquiry. The first, does the executive order issued by the acting governor exceed the governor's powers? Well, according to Idaho Code Section 67802, the deputy attorney general said, well, yes, it does. The supreme executive power of the state is vested by Section 5, Article 4 of the Constitution of the state of Idaho in the governor who is expressly charged with the duty of seeing that the laws are faithfully executed. And if need be, in order to make sure that happens, the governor can issue executive orders from time to time, which carry the force of law. So orders are meant to ensure laws are faithfully executed. However, in regards to this executive order to ban mask mandates, since there is no existing law prohibiting such mandates, acting Governor McGeehan has exceeded the executive order authority granted her under Idaho Code Section 67802. Not, oh, there's more. Not only does this executive order not seek to ensure laws are faithfully executed, oddly, it seems to have been issued in an effort to undermine the existing authorities of the state and its political subdivisions to issue mask mandates. In fact, wrote Kane, this executive order appears to run counter to both the Idaho Constitution and the governor's statutory executive order authority. And because there is no existing law about mask mandates, this executive order seems to have created one. You can just do that, thus encroaching on the lawmaking power of the legislature, violating the separation powers of the branches of government. 
which answers Senator Wintrow's second question. Her third question was, does it violate or conflict with what the Constitution allows cities, counties, public health districts, or school districts to do in regard to public health? Stating several Idaho codes that give such local entities the power to do that, the opinion from Mr. Kane states McGeehan's executive order didn't cite any reasons to remove that local authority. So in conclusion, to answer your questions, Senator Wintrow, yes. The executive order issued yesterday by the acting governor was unconstitutional, illegal, and executive overreach, according to the state's attorney general's office, which leaves just one question unanswered. Are we going with overreaching McGeechan or overreaching McGeehan? What about what Idaho politicians are doing outside of Idaho, say in Washington, D.C.? There was this vote this morning in the Senate on whether they would go along with the House and create a bipartisan commission that would study the January 6th attack on the Capitol. They needed 60 votes. It fell short by six. One of those was a no vote by Idaho Senator Mike Crapo. Another was a non vote by Idaho Senator Jim Risch. Senator Risch was absent. Apparently he was attending his granddaughter's high school graduation ceremonies here in Idaho, according to a tweet, and he wasn't alone in his absence. He was one of nine Republicans not there. 11 senators total missed the vote, but Senator Risch said if he had been there, he would have voted against the commission, saying he had reservations on politicians leading a commission to investigate the insurrection and wants to rely on the ongoing investigations by the FBI. Worth noting, Senator Risch is a senior member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, which looks into attacks and attempted attacks on our democracy on a regular basis. Recently and most notably, the investigation into Russian interfering in the 2016 election. So what about Senator Crapo's reason for voting no? Well, we asked for one but we have yet to hear back. Remember, this was a bill that would have formed a 10 member commission that was evenly split between the two parties. It was to look into the worst attack on the US Capitol in 200 years. Five people died from that attack, including a Capitol police officer. A commission Idaho Congressman Mike Simpson was in favor of earlier this month, but Idaho Congressman Russ Fulcher was not. Put off because of the pandemic, the Idaho Veterans Cemetery is getting a significant and sentimental addition this weekend. A symbol of sacrifice and single-mindedness. Well, don't head out and start your holiday weekend just yet. I mean, at this point, the roads out of town are all backed up, so you might as well hang out with us for a bit more. To pass the time, how about you send us your questions and comments to the number on your screen. Text them to 208-321-5614. Just make sure to include your name and the hashtag, the 208. And if you stick around to the end of the show, we might share yours like we do with Kathy's from Star. This weekend, Memorial Day weekend, as you can expect, there's going to be a ceremony held at the Idaho Veterans Cemetery in Boise, something they've done every year since its completion in August of 2004. But this year, there's going to be something special. Idaho was the last state in the union to build a state veteran cemetery, but it got done because of the push from then Governor Dirk Kempthorne, 
who just happened to have spearheaded the latest addition to that hallowed ground. A couple of years ago, Governor Kempthorne approached Boise sculptor Benjamin Victor, a world class artist who has pieces all over the globe. Kempthorne drove Benjamin up to the cemetery to to the top, you know, where that road makes a loop. And he said, we need something right there in that empty space. Well, Benjamin agreed. And with that initial investment from governor, former governor and his wife, Patricia, well, the sculptor got to work. And in the bronze, there's actually wheat that we had to cut off to mold separate. Spend any amount of time with Benjamin Victor. And one of only two statues in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And you can see the emotion he shares for his subjects. But the detail in the hair. Yeah, yeah, that was fun too. Yeah, of all the characters, the long hair and the muscles made it great to work on. From elation. Yeah, and I got to talk to Lyle. <laughs> I got to meet him. To admiration. And so Cecil, uh, he really struggled and he was kind of an unsung hero. It's that reverence that guided Benjamin to create his latest sculpture. There's never a higher calling than the military, you know, and, and being able to celebrate the service that they've done and memorialize all the, you know, the dedication they've had to, to give. He calls it, I will have your back always, a multi-generational recognition of the sacrifice and fidelity that will sit as a focal point in one of the highest points of the Idaho Veterans Cemetery. So you've got the kneeling soldier that's kneeling with his hands clasped, and he's got the dog tags of his fallen brethren in his hands, and he's looking out over those graves. And he's in Vietnam gear, and then to his back is a female soldier with her hand on his shoulder. And she's there saying, I've got your back, and she's in the current modern gear, and she's looking out at the flag as she faces over the city as a protector. The concept may be the biggest part of this piece. I want them to walk up to the sculpture and really take a look. But Benjamin also hopes the little things get noticed too. In the stitch work and in the gear and clothing and the time that it took to create it. Especially by veterans. And that's really meaningful to them because they wore that gear. So it's more than it is just to the average person when they touch that and they come up close to it and they see the flak jacket on that Vietnam soldier, you know, as he's kneeling. That really moves them because that's the gear they wore. That's what they were in. Benjamin's been sculpting for decades and he can explain in detail what it takes to put one together. Well, first I actually weld together an armature, which is like a skeleton. From the steel start to the special patina polish. It is every tint, tone, and even some color to match the real gear and clothing. But for him, these pieces begin way before the clay is ready to cast thanks to what he was told by a mentor. Now, listen, youngster, that's what he used to call me. You, we're gonna go and we're gonna talk to all of these veterans and we're gonna get their thoughts because if you go out there and you just sculpt something because you think it's great and it doesn't mean anything to them, then that's not what we're going for. When you spoke to these veterans, what did you take for that? What did they tell you? What was the, the thing that stood out to you about what they felt? Again and again, you hear from different veterans over different eras that that camaraderie between them is what keeps them together. So to show a piece that's not only in mourning and not only in protection, but also has the connection between the two with her hand on his shoulder is really something that's special to the veterans and that's what I wanted to do for them. It's a pretty powerful piece. You can see that statue unveiled tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. at the Idaho Veterans Cemetery located off Old Horseshoe Bend Road in Boise. They were supposed to have this event last Memorial Day weekend, but at the time, COVID restrictions wouldn't allow them to have more than 10 people together. And they believe that that kind of attendance wouldn't do this justice. So they are hoping for a big crowd tomorrow morning with veterans from all over the state to show up. And you can see that detail and feel the significance of that statue for yourself. Remember, Monday is Memorial Day. and We want to honor Idahoans who have made the ultimate sacrifice. So before you do head out for this holiday weekend, we want you to send us your pictures of the veterans that mean something to you. Include their name. We want to know their rank, branch of service and conflict if applicable. And you could do all that on our social media pages. You can reach us on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, or even over email. Send your email address. Send that picture, I should say, to the email address at the bottom of the screen right there, the 208 at ktvb.com. We're going to be sharing your pictures during Monday's show.
Before I forecast 97 for a high, and that's right, I'll show you the seven day forecast coming up. Let's look at a little snow. This is up at Tamarack Resort. You can see how it cleared out over the valley for this afternoon. We're getting ready for the weekend, which is more sunshine and warmer temperatures. Winds today are still just a little below 15 miles an hour, but we've had some gusts up to 25. They're not going entirely away, but they're going to come down a little bit for tomorrow. 68 was the high, 73 for Ontario. Very pleasant temperatures. That changes as we jump probably another 10 degrees for the high temperature tomorrow. Look at this, you've got sunny and 77 degrees. And then as you look at the rest of the weekend, by the time we hit Sunday, we're already up to 82. Then you can see an 87, Tuesday's 91, 97 for Wednesday, 95 for Thursday, Friday with 89 degrees. And look at all the sunshine throughout the area as these temperatures continue to warm up a bit for us. In fact, over here uh, on Sunday, we'll see that temperature that's gonna be all the way up to 82 degrees for the high temperature there. Now looking at the Magic Valley, there's 76 degrees for the high. Gives you an idea of the temperatures for the weekend as well. You're gonna have mostly sunny skies. Next week, probably getting up to about a 94 on Wednesday. That's the hot spot. As you look at Friday, you can see the high temperature there. Now many of you maybe be thinking about the mountains, so it is sunny tomorrow. And this is one of the first times in a long time that we've seen sunshine for the next seven days. So 67 for tomorrow. And get this, as you get into Sunday, it's into the 70s, still remains the Sundays. Then we're going to be seeing some temperatures that'll get up around 80 degrees for Tuesday. Warmest in the mountains will be about 85, but that's pretty warm for the mountains. 82 for Thursday and Friday with the high temperature of 76 degrees. Highs will start coming down next weekend. <laughs>
final minute before this holiday weekend, Rebecca already in the Memorial Day spirit. She said she went up to see her papa today at Veterans Cemetery. They're all special and honored to be in such a beautiful way there. Yeah, it is a certainly a sight up there at the Veterans Cemetery already today on this Friday. Lieutenant uh, Janice McGeehan caused chaos in West Ada School District. What a mess she created. We heard about that today, Rob. People being told to wear masks, not wanting to wear masks because they thought they didn't have to. It was certainly a mess. Considering her order was unconstitutional, CISA wants to know, could we be impeaching McGeechan or maybe impeaching McGeehan? Is that how that I, I, I don't know. We should have a vote. Maybe we have a new drinking game. We take a shot every time you air a text from Kathy from Star says James. Well, James, let's get your weekend started right. So all of us in the country are supposed to be just forget that the insurrection happened. It was a horrible and deadly event. Oh, that's right. The GOP would rather not have to face what happened, says Kathy from Star. Have a good weekend.